This will be, this will be my third time at the pulpit here. And I want to open with saying that I take this very seriously. It's a privilege to be able to teach God's word to God's people. And it's something that I and anyone behind the pulpit should take very, very seriously and not take lightly. And I would just want to open with that. And that being said, it's a privilege and an honor to be here. We'll open in prayer before we open our Bibles, open our hearts first. Amen. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so good to us, Lord. You are so awesome, Lord. You are almighty. Thank you for this building, Lord. Thank you for all who came here, Lord. Nothing happens by chance, Lord. You are sovereign and all-knowing. Use me, Lord. Use me as a useful vessel for your kingdom, Lord. Let all the honor and glory go to you only, Lord. Remove me from this, Lord, and let me be spirit-led by your spirit, Lord. And let this be for the edification of your people, Lord. And the glory of all goes to you. In Jesus' holy, mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, if any of you are of any sort of student of the Bible, you'll know this passage of Scripture, the second half of Romans 1, is a very, very profound section of Scripture. It's um, something that we are seeing now in our current society. And it's something that's very, very important for us to know. To get some context and theme of what's going on in the book of Romans, the book of Romans theme is the righteousness that, is, that comes from God. This is a word and a theme that's used over 30 times throughout the book of Romans. And Paul is the author, and he makes it clear in verse 17 that the righteousness that comes is coming from God, that there is no righteousness in us besides God that dwells in us. And to be righteous, to be righteous, is a state or a condition of complying to God's law perfectly. And as we know, we are human, and we cannot do this. This is impossible to fully abide by God's law perfectly throughout our lifetime. And we cannot do it. It's impossible. Right? Romans 3 will say all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? We are all guilty. We are all guilty. Later in Romans chapter 6, it'll say the wages of sin are death. What is that? Your payment or what you get in return for your sin, which everyone has sinned, is death, right? But we know the answer is that because you put your faith in Christ, because you put your faith in Christ, God sees you now robed in Christ's righteousness. Right? And it's very important for the church to understand that first. And Paul, he's going to go into detail here, as we'll see, but it's amazing that God, that, that Paul, in this letter, he doesn't say, you know, that the righteousness comes from God, and then he doesn't go into a section of Scripture saying how much God loves you, and how, un how forgiving God is, and how much mercy God is showing you. He goes right into this part of Scripture, which is very interesting. He doesn't start with the love of God. He doesn't start with God's mercy or God's forgiveness. And this is important for us to know this first, is that 
there's other characteristics of God besides that. Why is this crucial? Because the main problem with man and the main problem in this world is sin. This is the problem. You get, get down to the root of the problem. Paul here opens in Romans 1, throwing blows. He comes out and he's just like convicting and telling and giving piles and piles and piles of evidence on why man is guilty. Here in this section is Paul is going to be talking to the pagans or to the Gentiles or to the non-believers and he's going to give a list of reasons why this group of people is guilty. Later in chapter 2, we're not going to cover it, he's going to say, okay, this is the Gentiles. Chapter 2, he starts, here's the evidence and reasons why all Jews are guilty. Then he goes and goes all the way, bleeds into chapter 3, pretty much where he summarizes and says, everybody is guilty. And this is important to stand on and to know because what happens is when churches preach the love of God only and they preach the grace of God only and they pre preach the mercy of God only, people, they come to a point where they receive and they think that the grace is coming to them and the grace is coming to them. They come to a point where they now expect the grace of God. They expect it. They expect His forgiveness. They expect it, expect it. Then it comes to a point where they start demanding it. They start demanding God's grace. They say, no, God is love. He's going to love me the way I am. And this is very dangerous for the church. Very dangerous. You can't only preach the love of God and tickle the congregation's ears. We stand here with the full-hearted belief that all Scripture, how much is all? All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So no matter what the Scripture is saying, it's for what? Correcting us, teaching us, training us, and it's just amazing, it's just amazing that when learning about the topic today, which is God's wrath, when learning about God's wrath and getting a deeper understanding of God's wrath, it makes all of God's other characteristics shine so much brighter. It makes all of his characteristics shine so much brighter. It's important that We know that God's characteristics don't just stand alone. All of God's characteristics, they work together perfectly. It's hard with our human minds to understand this. But all of God's characteristics work together in unity and in such perfect harmony with each other that it's just amazing to see. And even, even in God's wrath, even in God's wrath, which is something that we cannot comprehend alone. There's love in it. There's love in it. Here's an example, a real life example. If any of you have children and you come to the point with your children that you have to discipline your children. When you come to the point of having to discipline your children, do you throw love in the closet and you say, at this point, I'm not going to be loving my child. I'm going to be disciplining my child. No, they're together. You love your child. If you love your child, you discipline your child, right? Amen. Just like God's word says, God loves whom he dis or God disciplines whom he loves, right? Amen. One example of this, when I first, first taught this with the youth when I first started teaching the youth about a year and a half ago. 
I went through Romans expository, and here we came upon this section, and I grabbed the whiteboard, and I grabbed the marker, and I asked the youth, okay, youth, list me some of the characteristics of God. They say, love, patient, kind, good. They keep going, he's just, he's full of grace, he's merciful, he's forgiving, he's, and all these things, which are all very good answers, obviously, but I did this because I knew that they weren't going to say one of God's characteristics was wrath. And I said, here you go. Let me show, show it to you guys how they work so good together. One of God's characteristics is God is just, right? God, he is fair. He does things justly. And if there was no wrath, if there was no wrath or no anger of God, where would the justice come from? Where would the justice come from? They don't, it, the just wouldn't be possible without the wrath. How about God's mercy? Isn't knowing about God's wrath more make his mercy so much greater? What are you receiving mercy from? You're receiving mercy from God's wrath. How about God's love, right? We went over it a little bit, but God's love wouldn't be so perfect if there was no wrath. And the, the shining example of, of the perfect love is when Jesus was on the cross in Calvary and he received what? The wrath of God upon him for all of our sins, right? So what I want to clarify is that all of his characteristics work together in perfect harmony. And another thing is one could argue, one could argue that another does not fully understand salvation, that one does not fully understand salvation without understanding God's wrath. Why do I say that? People nowadays, they say, I'm saved, or you ask them, are you saved? And they treat it as like a, like a ticket for heaven. They say, oh, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. Well, what, are you, what are you saved from? What are you saved from, your sins? What are you saved from? The reality is, as Christians, what we're saved from is God's wrath. We're saved from God pouring his wrath on us because we deserve it and for fun's sakes giving us a holy elbow is what we deserve you know but we are saved from what his wrath so that was a pretty long introduction but we'll get into scripture if you have your bibles you could open them to romans 1 i have it here on the screen also Romans 1, starting in verse 18. I'm reading out of a New King James Version. <clears throat> we'll start in verse 18. We'll just do this one verse for now. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What I want to make clear, what I want to make clear is what is wrath when God is exhibiting it. The wrath of God is not something that is an outburst of anger. It's not something that's not calculated it's not something that's done in rash. When God exhibits wrath, when God exhibits his wrath or shows his wrath, it's righteous, it's holy, it's very, very calculated when he does it. It's not like how, on the contrary, when man is wrathful 
or when man shows wrath, this is a negative thing for the most part. Besides righteous, righteous indignation, when man shows wrath or anger, it's a negative thing. Here we see an example of this. If you go back to Genesis, Genesis 4 with Cain and Abel, when Cain brought his offering from the field and the Lord did not accept his offering, what happened with Cain? He became angry. The same angry is a wrath, but a, a, a wrath that comes from man, mere man. And he became angry, and what did he do? We all know the story. He killed his brother, right? Proverbs fifteen eighteen. A wrathful man, a wrathful man stirs up strife. Proverbs 19:19 19, 19, A man of great wrath will suffer punishment for if you rescue him you'll have to do it again So we see God's wrath which is something that's righteous holy deserved just calculated not out of anger I mean out of like an outburst of anger and we see the wrath of man which causes man to do wicked, vile things like kill their brother in the example of Cain and Abel. Or the wrath of man will stir up strife and will ultimately end the word they will suffer punishment, as Proverbs says. Throughout, throughout the Bible and throughout the history, we could see a few types of wrath that God exhibits. The first one will be eternal wrath. This eternal wrath is in hell. This is a wrath that is going to happen for non-believers that reject Christ. They're going to go to hell and they're going to be experiencing eternal wrath, forever wrath. A second time of type of wrath will be eschatological wrath. This is the wrath that will be poured out by God on the end of the world. End days wrath, when the Lord returns, end times wrath. We also see a cataclysmic wrath. A cataclysmic wrath. And this is something huge or destructive. Um, examples of this will be the flood of Noah. This is a uh, example of God's judgment or God's wrath upon people that were disobedient. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah, God destroyed the, the city with fire and brimstone. Um, you could say 9-11, any natural earthquakes, hurricanes, this is a form of judgment and a form of wrath from God. Another type is a consequential wrath. This type of wrath has the idea and uses the principle of sowing and reaping. You do bad, and the consequences of doing bad is you receive bad. You know, you do, you do a crime, the consequence, jail. But here in this scripture, here in this passage, we are going to be dealing specifically with the wrath of abandonment. This is something, as we see here, for the wrath of God is revealed or is being revealed or is a constant being revealed of God abandoning either an entire nation or people individually. It goes both ways. What happens and why this happens will go over But it's where after a continued rejection, a continued rebellion, a continued disobedience of a nation or a person, God will abandon them. And this is the reason why I chose this because I believe that now 
we are in a state of where a lot of people have been abandoned by God, and you'll see why. And it's not my place to say, but a nation also. We've, we're seeing the effects, as we, you'll see in Scripture, the effects of when God abandons a nation or a person and what happens thereafter. And after we continue reading, you'll understand why I say this. But why? Why does God abandon people? We see in Scripture the wrath of God or the, the wrath of abandonment by God is against what? All ungodliness and unrighteousness who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. To suppress something, to suppress something, there has to be something there to suppress. And we're going to go over that next. What's being suppressed is the knowledge of God, the truth of God. And everyone has this truth. Everyone has this knowledge of God, as we'll see here, verse 19. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. What may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, His, God's, Invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. <clears throat> Inside all of us, God has sovereignly planted, believe it or not, the existence of his very nature in our character. Either through our conscience, as we see here, that he made known to us, or in verse 20, through creation. We sung that song today that's mentioned that in his creation, we see his glory. John 1, 9. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into this world. Every man in their conscience, has a knowing of God. And this knowing isn't a saving faith or saving knowledge, but it's enough where people could be, as we read here, without excuse. People, they have no excuse. There's in them, in creation, and in their conscience, there's a knowledge of God that's there. When I read this verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, saying, in creation, you could see God. I thought to myself, where is something that I could just see God in creation that is just so obvious? And the first thing I think of is how our solar system is together, how our sun is a certain distance from our earth and how our moon is a certain distance from the earth and how they rotate and we have 24 hour days to the point that they control tides and migration patterns and all that stuff and we don't freeze, we're not too hot. I mean, that alone is mind blowing to me. I don't know about you, but it just like yells at me that there is a creator. Maybe for you it's different. How about any of us here that have had the blessed privilege to bring a child into this world? When you have a child born, I'm getting chills. When my kids were born, it was just like, how could people deny God? This is so evident. It so, was so evident for me. Psalm 19.1 the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. God, he's holding every man accountable. We are without excuse, holding every man accountable for their refusal 
for the refusal of God. Why? Because it's obvious that there's a creator. It's very obvious. Here's a few examples, very, very few examples of this. In human nature, or in human body and in nature, you see a lot of similarities. And the crazy thing is not only do these similarities look exactly alike, but they each function the same way, too. You could take a tree stump and you could use it as a fingerprint. Look at the tree branch and how it looks like a lung there for bringing in oxygen and for respiratory, right? The veins in a leaf and the, the veins in a river are just like human veins, and they do the same thing. They move fluid around. Those are just a few, a few of the things. So here we could begin to see why God is abandoning people, because his creation is so evident. It's so evident. He even puts it in our conscience, and people, they refuse it. They deny it. They suppress the truth, which we already read. And here is the reason why God's wrath is coming out. He's angry, but just, justly angry, right? Creation is so obvious, yet we reject it. Man rejects it. Verse 21. Because although they knew God, we already covered that, they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creepy things. Here we have another reason why God's wrath has come. Man, they're ungrateful. We need to know and always know that all good that comes to us is from God. And when you come to a point, and when, especially when people come to a point where they're completely ungrateful and oblivious to God, it angers Him. Another thing, they did not glorify Him. They did not glorify Him as God. As created beings, as created beings, our chief purpose and our main purpose here on earth is to glorify God. Scripture repeatedly says this. Scripture demands this, that our purpose here on earth is to bring God glory. Amen. When people are not doing this, when people are not doing this, Here's why God's wrath is poured out because he's angry and justly angry. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Bringing glory to God for us Christians is honoring him, praising him for who, who he is, his perfection and his love and mercy towards us in a way where our lives are mirroring Christ. When we glorify God with our lifestyle, people should be able to see Christ in us. That's what it means to bring glory. And in this nowadays world, this is why I'm talking about this is you do not see this in people whatsoever. People, they don't even mention God ever throughout their whole life. 
They don't mention him or give thanks to him. And they become what? Futile in their thoughts. When someone becomes futile in their thoughts at this stage, when someone becomes futile at this stage, they begin to justify their wrongdoings into thinking that they're right or they come up with some other theology or whatever you want to call it to make their God. They become, their mind is completely left over to think whatever is fitting, right? And when this happens, they profess to be wise, but they're fools. I don't know about you, but anybody that I know that's wise, anybody that I know that's wise, has never told me that they are wise. I mean, you don't, if you're wise, you, you won't profess it. You won't say that you're wise. And if someone tells you that they're wise, I would think the opposite. People nowadays, they have more degrees than thermometers, yet they're dumb as rocks nowadays. You know? If you come to, come to me, I don't care how many degrees you have or how smart you are. If you do not believe that there is a God that created you, you're a fool. Psalm 14.1, the fool says in his heart, the fool says in his heart that there is no God. So I don't care how many PhDs you have. If you don't believe there's a God, you're a fool. According to God's word, I didn't write it, I just read it, okay? <clears throat> and it comes to a point where people, they've already denied God, they're unthankful to God, they don't glorify God, their mind becomes futile, their hearts are darkened, where they now change from worshiping God, who's all-worthy, to worshiping whatever. Here, it says examples of birds and four-footed animals. And, and what this is really full, fully encompassing is just any type of worship idol. Any type of worship idol. I said to myself, what type of, what type of animals are people worshiping, you know? And you look up this stuff, and it's very interesting it was kind of funny for me to read these things. Eagles are considered sacred animals. They symbolize strength and courage and freedom. I don't know about you, but the only freedom I need is to be freed from sin, and only Jesus does that for me. No, no eagle. Crows and ravens are, are thought of as divine messengers. Divine creatures for a divine purpose. Peacocks in Hinduism are associated with one of their many gods and symbolize beauty, wisdom, and knowledge, the peacock. So let me get this straight. You're claiming to be wise and your wisdom and knowledge and understanding comes from a peacock, no wonder you're being called a fool. <clears throat> Cows in Hinduism are considered sacred, right? They're considered and symbolize motherhood and nonviolence. But I don't know if you know about cows, they could be very, very violent. Elephants are worshipped as a form of God. They're considered great movers of obstacles for some. And what I wonder is, when these people that worship elephants for being great obstacle movers, when they first saw a bulldozer or a forklift, did they begin worshiping that too? That's what I think. It's like, man. Other, just to list them off, lions, cats, roosters, snakes, beetles, are all worshipped as gods for these people that have become futile in their mind and keep rejecting the Lord. 
So why is the wrath of God revealed? Because man suppresses the truth. Man, they exchange God for idols. They don't glorify God at all in their lives. They're extremely ungrateful to God and have no knowledge or mindset of thanking God and because they think that everything they do comes from themselves. So here's why the wrath of God comes on to these people or these men because of this. Starting in verse 24, here we're going to see the downward spiral that happens when God abandons a person. Here is the beginning of it. We went over why he does it, and here we're going to cover how. How. Verse 24. Therefore, why is the therefore there? It's to talk about the previous text. Therefore, because people, they suppress the truth, because people deny God, because people are ungrateful to God, God gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Amen. This term gave them up or other translations will say gave them over. This is the wrath of abandonment here. This is what it is. Where because in our conscience we know that there's a God. God has instilled that. We just read that. There comes a point in people's lives where they continually reject God, suppress His truth, ungrateful towards God, over and over and over again, God will give them over. And this give them over is actually a judicial term that could be used in a courthouse where the sentencing of this person because of their continued disobedience, the sentencing or the giving them over is them going to their sentencing. So when God abandons or when God gives a person or a nation over, it's God releasing his hands of grace on these people, and now they're left to do their own wicked, heartful desires inside of this wicked world, ran by a wicked Satan, and God he's, says, okay, here you go. You want to do it? Do it. And then people, they come like monsters. They turn into monsters in complete wickedness and debauchery, and here's what we're seeing now. Here's what we're seeing now. Here's what we're seeing now. One may think, man, God, he can't do that. Man, that's harsh. Or may think otherwise of what God does. But let me tell you something. When God does this, when God abandons a person, it is actually very graceful and merciful towards people because when we look at God and when he exhibits wrath on people throughout history or throughout the Bible specifically, it could be way worse and way worse in a deserving way. An example of this, if you go back to Leviticus 10, Leviticus 10, the sons of Aaron, two sons of Aaron, they were priests. They were priests. And I'll summarize it for you. They began to do some experiments during worshiping God. They lit these uh, scepters on fire, and the Lord had told them not to do it. And they did it, and they wanted to do some experiment in worship. And right when this happened, the Lord struck fire from heaven and executed them both. So these guys were priests. They were believers of God. They were honoring God. They weren't suppressing the truth like we see now. And they got executed by God justly and rightly. So, so when God abandons people, 
it's actually very merciful because we see people that are doing way worse things than these guys did, way worse, and they don't get struck down like they did. How about uh, an axe, Ananias and Sapphira, when they came, when they came and they lied about their offering, what happened? Dead. You know, so the wrath of abandonment or God abandoning people is not something harsh. It's actually very not harsh. It's very loving, actually, because the people that do this, man, imagine if you were God and people, they disobey you. Boom, you're like, because we're humans, but yeah, I mean, that's what stood out to me the most was even through his wrath, there's love. Here's an example. There's mercy. There's patience. There's kindness. And all this because we see other examples of him in the Old and New Testament. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but where his wrath is a bit more drastic. One thing I'm going to point out here is when God gives over people or when God takes his hands off people that are in complete disobedience, what happens? The lusts of their hearts go first. The lusts of their hearts or the desires of their hearts go first. And what follows behind the hearts is their bodies. What do we know about our hearts? Jeremiah says the heart is more deceitful than anything else and desperately wicked. The human heart is wicked. Never, ever follow your heart. So when God takes his restraining hands, his restraining grace, and gives a person or nation over, we're left to that wicked heart. To do what? To dishonor our bodies and to just go rampant. And that's what we see. That's what we see. When a man is left to its wicked self with their wicked heart, we turn into animals. Which is crazy to think because man turns into what we worship. If you're not worshiping God, and you're worshiping whatever, you could put anything there, which is not good, you turn into that. You turn into that. That's why, as Christians, as believers, we are to what? Fix our eyes on Jesus. And being a Christian is to be what? Christ-like. Romans 8, 29 for whom he foreknew, which is believers, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. As Christians, we are to be conformed to the image of Jesus. That's why it's so important to come to Oikos and be with Christians that are like-minded, to come to church service, to be in his word, to listen to his music, to meditate upon his word. Otherwise, you're in the world, right? There's a, there's a saying that says, show me your friends and I'll tell you your character, right? Or the other saying, if you hang out in a barber shop long enough, you're bound to get a haircut. Meaning, you're in wickedness, your friends are all wicked and don't glorify God. You're going to become like them. Plain and simple. You could argue otherwise, but there would be no argument. Now, when man, when man worships and serves a creature, rather than the creator, man is now devolving. We're taking a step back. Instead of moving forward, we're moving backwards as a society as an individual, and this isn't good. 
Verse 26. Here we'll see the second time we'll see gave them up. For this reason, for what reason? For this reason, people, they're disobedient, they're suppressing the truth, they're not glorifying God, they're ungrateful. For this reason, which we've covered, God gave them up. God abandoned them to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use of what is against nature. A.K.A. lesbianism. Verse 27, Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty, their error which was due. It's crazy the first thing that happens when God releases his restraining hands on people is their hearts are free to run rampant, our bodies follow, and the first things that we see is sexual immorality, promiscuity, homosexuality, pornography, pedophilia, all this stuff, because God he says, do it. You, you want to do it? Here you go. And what comes from it is only wickedness, sodomy, debauchery, and bad. Now, men, you don't even know what a woman is, people. They don't even, can't even describe what a woman is. What's a woman? And the men, they dress like women to dress like men. and It's, it's wicked. I don't know. There's no other way to put it. But straight wickedness, you could see this, and I see it all the time on downtown Palm Springs, and you see it, and it's so sad and sinister and wicked, and you read this passage of Scripture, and you say, man, God's Word is so true to the detail, to the detail of stuff like this. You say, man, no, no way, God, He's going to describe this. Here it is. We're seeing it now. We're seeing this now. Abandonment is now in effect, and it has been and will be. We're based on complete disobedience and rejection of God over and over again. God, he'll leave people and abandon people, take his restraining hands off people to let their wicked and evil desires go crazy. And we're seeing this firsthand. And what happens, here we see a part of the consequential wrath that we talked about, where they're receiving in themselves the penalty of their error. Because you're doing error, you're going to receive penalty, right? And some of the effects of sodomy or homosexuality, however you want to call it, are very, very evident in Scripture. You could see what happens over and over. In Old Testament times, this stuff was a capital offense. If you were caught in homosexuality, executed. Now, with modern science, they test chemical components inside of homosexual brains, and they see that inside of a brain of someone who's practicing homosexuality, there's different components in their brain than in someone that is heterosexual. And what these doctors ascribe it to is that this is why they are homosexual, because they have different components in their brain. But from knowing God's word and reading here, this is not why, this is the result the result of God abandoning them and them, them going to their wicked, evil desires, they're now the penalty of their error is now their brain is not producing the components it should be as a normal. 
Other thing we see in history is societies as a whole begin to crumble when homosexuality runs rampant. An example of this is the Roman Empire. 14 of the last 15 Roman emperors were homosexual. They hired all homosexual generals. And what came to the point after that is that the army was no longer willing to fight. They're not designed like men, like they're supposed to be. It's very important to understand this, that when men crumble, society crumbles. And I'm talking about real men, godly men, God-fearing men. When these men are down, society is down. Just like women. I mean, we, society is dependent on women, feminine women, mothers, doing God's duty, God's plan for them is extremely crucial in society. They need mom, mothers and women in the home taking care of the kids. If they're not there in the home taking care of the kids, what happens? The kids and society crumbles generations after. We read also that the effects of this abandonment, the effects of our wicked hearts running rampant are inevitable. Jesus speaking in Luke 17, as it was in the days of Lot, this is Jesus speaking, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. When Jesus said this, he's saying, just like it was in the days of Lot, he's referring to all the way back in Genesis, this is Sodom and Gomorrah. Just like it was then, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. How was it in the days of Lot? Very similar to now. When God, in Genesis 19, when God sent angels to Sodom and Gomorrah to save Lot, the men of that city, which were homosexual men, began marching in the streets. And they didn't title this in the Bible as a pride parade, but that's what it is nowadays. You see pride parade and it's men marching in the streets full of arrogance and pride. And here we are. We are in the days of Lot currently. But what does this mean knowing that homosexuality is inevitable? that Jesus said it himself, does this mean that us Christians should just be okay with it? Does it mean that we should be passive about it? No. We need to, as Christians, be the leading front fighting against this type of perversion, against our society, against our kids, and family structures in the home. By, through prayer, through awareness, through however such means. But it never ever comes to a point because we know it's inevitable to be approving of it. Very important. <clears throat> Homosexuality also is something that is inexcusable. We are without excuse for stuff like this. And you hear the excuse, I was born this way, or I was made this way, which is a very, very valid excuse because yes, you were born a sinner. Yes, you were born a sinner, just like me. But if I have the desire inside of me to do any sin, steal from somebody, murder somebody, does that make it okay for me to be a thief and a murderer because I have, this is how it's made. I want to steal that. I want to kill that person. So because you're made that way is a very lame excuse or inexcusable. 
So we see the negative effects of sin, specifically homosexuality. But the reason why God tells us not to sin is because sin is bad. Sin is bad. You can't point to me one sin and justify to me why that sin is good. He tells us not to sin, not to destroy our fun or whatever you want to think about. He tells us not to sin because it's for our own good. And we see it throughout history that the effects of sin are detrimental. So now that monster inside of us that God has allowed to come out started in our hearts, moved to our bodies, right, where we shame our bodies and disgrace ourselves. We now get the consequences of it. And after that, it'll move to your mind. It moves to your mind. Verse 28. We're just going to do verse 28 right now. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, let me say that again, and even as they did not like to retain God, In their knowledge, the third time, God gave them over to debased minds to do things which are not fitting. Now our heart moved to our bodies, and now this wickedness has moved to our minds to the point where our minds are now debased, or other translations will say, depraved, the minds now, God has tested the minds of people and of men and that they're completely disobedient and reject God over and over again. God refers to their minds as being debased or depraved and this word is used for something that is useless, worthless, full of impurities, cannot be used at all. comes to a point where they're useless, right? (coughs) Jeremiah 6.30 People will call them rejected silver because the Lord has rejected them. As Christians, we shouldn't come anywhere near being useless, worthless, full of impurities, but rather we should be people that are very, very dependable, very trustworthy, high morals, very skilled in our trade. We shouldn't be anywhere near useless. All God's children have a a use for the kingdom. And we're there. On the other hand, on the other hand, Be cautious of, if you're an employer, be cautious of hiring pagans or non-believers because the lack of morals, the lack of trustworthiness is easier there. I'm not saying all of them, but with the lack of God in someone's life, comes the lack of all the good characteristics of God. Now we see three examples and three hows of God's abandonment. He gave them over, he gave them over, he gave them over. Gave over their hearts, their minds, right? He took his hands off them, let them run rampant. Then what happened? Sexual immorality. They came, came into vile passions and they did things that aren't right according to God. Then it comes to a point where God's hands have been off. Their mind, I mean their heart and their body have been full of impurities. And it comes to the point where the mind now is now full of impurities. And it comes to a point where that person is useless. 
Then starting in verse 29, we see now the full floodgates. The floodgates of this wrath of abandonment and the effects of it. It's like a, a sewer of sin. It's now opened up in these individuals or nation where sin is now in full swing. And Paul, he's not going to miss a beat. He's not going to leave anything unattached. He's going to pretty much cover all of it here. And as I'm reading this list, think about, do you witness this? Do you witness this in the world around you? Verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliceness, full of envy, people are murderers, full of strife, deceitful, evil-minded. They are whispers or gossipers, backbiters. People are haters of God. They're violent. They're proud. Boasters, inventors of evil, not only doing evil, but inventing new evils. Disobedient to parents. This was also a capital offense in Old Testament times. 31, people are undiscerning. They do not know what's right or wrong anymore. They're untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, we went over that multiple times, they know it, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, they also approve of those who practice them. It's very, very full list that approving those of practice them, it's a real reality in our society now where things that are deemed good are actually things that are very bad. And things that are very bad in the society are actually things that are good. We're in a backwards, backwards society where things that are legal should be illegal and things that are legal should be illegal. If a little boy in his elementary school class stands up and tells all of his peers and teachers, when I grow up, I want to become a pastor and serve the Lord. We wouldn't get any reaction. But if another boy stands up and says, you know what, I decided I'm not a man, I'm a woman. Wow, we're so proud of you. You have so much courage and strength to do it. This is society we're in. This is real. I'm not making this up. This happens. People approve of bad and disapprove of good. That's what we're at. You guys remember um, Bill Clinton when he was caught in adultery? When Bill Clinton was caught in his sexual immorality, his approval ratings went up. Why? Because sinners like other sinners. They like seeing other people sinning, and it makes them feel better about their own sin. So here, Scripture can... True again with that example there. But, I love that scripture, but God, right? There's always hope. I want to close with these few things. Revenge is for the Lord. Right? That's why he is the one that abandons people. He is the one that deems if someone is to be abandoned. It's not our duty. It's not our calling. It's not our decision or our opinion to deem or to de decide 
that some person or this person or that society or this society has been abandoned by God. Let me get that straight. That's very important. With God, there's always hope. And with God, all things are possible. They will never come to a point where a society or a person is too far gone. And it's not our decision to decide that. Also, we are not called as Christians to abandon anyone ourselves. This is God's duty and doing only. As Christians, we are called to love people to life and not to decide that God abandoned them. The great thing about the great thing about God is that if anyone turns to him in faith and believes in him, turns from their sins, repents, they shall be saved. That's a great, great promise, a great truth that all people could stand on if they decide to or not. And the thing about God's promises is that they're God's promises, which means they always come true. They always come true. They always come through. God is good all the time, right? All the time, God is good. So in summary, God hates sin. He's against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. And his wrath, in this specific case, wrath of abandonment, is something that's deserved. It's the people who suppress the truth and reject God over and over and over and over again. And when God abandons people, he abandons their heart and it goes down to their body and then their mind. And without God, without a restraining God in people's lives or in a nation, it's all bad, all wickedness, all sin. Because only good comes from the Lord. Only good comes from the Lord. I'm going to end in this. Psalm 81. This psalm is an example of that we heard with Sergio a couple weeks ago because I love how this message ties perfectly into his past series of how God, how Israel and the United States are both in the same history plan where God is abandoning and leaving. And here we see the hope. Psalm 81, starting in 12. So I gave them over. Here's the gave them over again abandonment. I gave them over to their own stubborn hearts to walk in their own counsel. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord will pretend submission to him, but their fate would endure forever. He would have fed them also with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock. I would have satisfied you. So even though there's abandonment, when people turn to the Lord, the Lord is there. There's not, the hope isn't lost and hope isn't gone. Even though people, they seem like they have no hope. and Maybe they do have no hope. The Lord is there. The Lord is there. So we have our duty to encourage people with that and to lead them, right? That's our Christian duty. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your goodness, Lord. 
You are full of grace. You are full of mercy. And even in your wrath, Lord, there is love. Thank you for saving us, Lord. Thank you for picking us up out of that mire clay and wickedness that we were in and bringing us into your light and making us new creations in you, Lord. We are so undeserving, but your grace showed us mercy, Lord. Thank you for all who came here today, Lord. Bless their week, Lord. Be with them this week. Be in their hearts and minds. And may your light shine through each and every one of us this week, Lord. In Jesus' holy, mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you.